This week on The Gadget Show. Otis and I become magnificent men as we attempt to build our very own flying machine to win the Worthing Birdman competition. But will we go up, diddly up, up, or down, diddly down, down? I test sports watches with the help of Olympic medalist Ewan Thomas. I didn't expect to be as fit as you. And John tests the very latest ultra-compact desktop PCs with money-saving guru Martin Lewis. There's something quite cool about being able to toss your computer in the air. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Actually, I'm, I should have mentioned this earlier. What? I just need to make sure that your opening bit here is serious. Because, you know, respectfully, sometimes you do clown around a bit, so <gasps> all right? A little bit too much tomfoolery sometimes. So serious, yeah? Can I just... Can I...? Do it. Go for it. OK. This week's challenge, as I was going to say, is serious, it is ambitious, and it is physically demanding. And essentially, it involves Jason and Otis, well, trying to fly. <laughs> Roger that, cabin doors to manual, all right? Wheels up, let's go down the wrong way. We're taking off and everything. Chicken or meat. Ow! Bird strike! I've had a bird strike! I'm going down! I'm going down! Bird strike! As our challenge began, Jason and I were still unsure of what lay ahead. All we'd been told was to head to Southampton University and await further instruction. Hello, mate. Oh, thank you. Why is he wearing that? It's a good look. Maybe it's a clue. Jason and Otis, you've been entered into this year's Worthing International Birdman competition. You have one month to design and build a man-powered craft that will enable you to fly from Worthing Pier. Brilliant! Yeah. <laughs> I know I've seen those guys. Yeah, so have I. They jump from high places, so there's a vertical aspect. But then there's it. also a flying aspect. <laughs> Yes, we would be entering the fear-inducing International Birdman competition, which for nearly 40 years has seen human flying machines from across the globe and nutters with wings strapped to their arms compete to take home a 30 grand jackpot prize for flying beyond 100 metres. No one has managed it yet, and as we researched the event, we could see why. You know what? It looks high. <laughs> Ow. Oh! It, yeah. Wow, look at him go, man. Face oh, plant. Oh, face yeah. plant. We'd be entering the Leonardo class for innovative self-built craft. Often the result of hundreds of man hours of careful engineering and craftsmanship, most, unfortunately, seem to spend mere seconds in the air before plummeting into the sea in a variety of painful ways. So, to avoid a similar fate, we were going to need some serious help. And that serious help could be found right here at Southampton University, because they have a long pedigree in aeronautics, having built the first ever successful human-powered aircraft back in the 1960s. We'd enlisted two of their aerodynamics experts, Dr. Kenji Takeda and Dr. Alex Forrester, who've honed their design skills on projects ranging from Formula One to aerospace research. Great to see you. Hi, Dave. Right there, you too. Hi, Excellent. Good to see you. All right. First up, we had to decide what sort of craft we wanted to build. OK, so given that's a class we're going to be in flying machines, what about some kind of propulsion tech? Well, the real... Using pedals. The issue here is basically weight. So you want to minimise the weight of the aircraft. Ah. And whilst if you have something like a bicycle, you'll generate some thrust, it's probably not going to be enough. Pedal power aircraft have worked in the past, yes. but they've got a runway. We've got four and a half metres. Four and a half metres. Well, it's, it's practically just a drop then, isn't it? Yes. When you come off the pier, you'll start accelerating yeah, as the, you the, the, drop gravity's the Gravity's our thrust, isn't it? And that's we need right. to then design a wing that's going to, at some point, pick up that thrust and turn it into lift. That's right. So, Alex began to put together a rough design to generate maximum lift based on a lightweight glider shape. Constructed around tough, flexible carbon tubes, the large, low wings at the front will be designed to bend in flight, with the pilot lying on top, controlling a stabilising tail fin at the back. And a very light framework structure, maybe make these out of foam, quite light, a bit flexible, but hopefully enough to get you off the pier and relatively wow. safely onto the ground. I guess, Jason, it's now down to you and I to get used to the idea of launching ourselves off a 10-metre platform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was just one problem. Both of us are terrified of heights, but one of us would have to pilot our creation. So to decide who, we headed to the Keys Diving Complex for a game of aerial chicken. We were suitably dressed for a contest of diving one-upmanship, moving up the boards to the terrifying 10 metres. 
Whoever went highest would get to pilot our flying machine in the competition. Birdman pilot selection. Birdman pilot selection. As we started out on the lowest board, neither of us were looking particularly graceful or feeling particularly brave. And that was the most pathetic board <laughs> in Britain. We are in trouble, man. We've got a long way to go. A long way to go. And I don't mean another nine metres. But despite a few nerves, we still managed to make a good job of the three-metre board. Our training on the lower boards was complete. It was time to move up to five metres. We climbed the stairs, puffed out our chests and strode manfully out, ready for our moment of glory. Then we looked over the edge. I just, I'm just too scared. I'm being really serious. I'm too scared, man. It was a long way down, and I well and truly lost my bottle. And that meant I was left high and dry. I can see you people at home are looking at me now like, yeah, Otis, do that thing, grab it, buy the horns, take it, run with it, dive with it. Get out of my way. I went to the edge to prove myself a man, indeed, a bird man. With neither of us apparently willing to take the plunge, it looked like our Birdman challenge might just be a dodo. But despite my pounding heart and knocking knees, I decided to give it one last go after some motivational advice from our Olympic instructor, Stacey Powell. You've never jumped off this board in your life, and at the end of the day, you just have to trust yourself, trust your coach, and just go. Stand on the end, arms up, deep breath, and jump. Don't think anything else. I may have been petrified, but I closed my eyes, thought of England, and... I'd done it, which also meant that, like it or not, I'd be our Birdman pilot. Only thing was, on the day, I'd have to jump face first from double the height. But hopefully, I'd be gliding over rather than plummeting into the water. You're supposed to be men. What do you mean, what's wrong with us? I'd like to see you jump off a five metre high diving board. I've already done that. Oh. Okay, boys, five metre diving board, swimming costume, are you watching? Yeah. Have you any idea how small and insignificant Jason and I now feel? <laughs> it's pathetic. <laughs> Listen, all I'm going to say is that we both expected, did we not, mm -hmm. to at least jump feet first off the 10 metre, yeah. without even really thinking about it, yes. to think that we were so racked with genuine fear at five metres, all I can say is it doesn't bode well for, for Worthing. Uh, it doesn't bode well for Worthing. I'm just going to say, you've got to fly off. Well, you've oh. got to fly off the end of Worthing Pier, which is really high up, with your flying machine. Don't tell me about it. Honestly, it's, even the mere thought of all of this petrifies me. I, don't, I can't believe what I've just seen. I absolutely can't <laughs> believe it. It's <laughs> very embarrassing, <laughs> trust it's me. It's shocking. <laughs> I'm so wishing you all the luck in the world. Now, you have to join us shortly because that's when they're going to make the flying machine, which is absolutely spectacular. Come on, Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Welcome back. A couple of years ago, the arrival of this, the Asus EPC, showed there was a huge demand for small laptops that were compact and cheap. Other manufacturers quickly saw the potential and soon produced a whole range of similar mini laptops we know today, of course, as netbooks. Now there's set to be a similar revolution in the plodding old world of desktop PCs, with the appearance of these net tops. They're small, versatile PCs. They cost between 150 and 300 pounds. They can consume as little as one-tenth of the power of a standard PC, and they're a neat solution if you don't like the idea of your computer dominating your room. But the question is, are they a fantastically good value new breed of computer, or just a load of cheap rubbish? Well, I've been testing three of the latest models to find out. 
To test my net tops, I sought the help of financial guru Martin Lewis, whose money-saving expert website is used by 8 million people and who's one of the most Googled people in Britain. I can see you're a net book user. How have you got on with it? This is my travel computer. Not impressed. What's wrong? This is a glorified word processor. I wouldn't use it for anything else. It does the job when I need to write articles on it, but frankly, for everything else, it's way too slow, far too frustrating, and makes me want to sort of gnash my teeth. With such a strong aversion to net books, would there be any chance of impressing Martin with the net tops? Being small and cheap, net tops should be ideal as a second home PC, say for a kid's bedroom or for playing online media through your TV. I'd chosen three top-of-the-range models, all with 1.6 GHz Atom processors and 160 GB hard drives, to try and impress tough critic Martin. First up was the Asus E-Box. It has a gigabyte of RAM, four USB sockets and runs Windows XP. So in tech spec terms, what's the difference between this and a netbook? Is it just the same thing plugged into a monitor? Well, it's a bit more powerful because it's got a separate graphics chip, which most uh, netbooks don't have. So it should be a bit quicker in general, providing your software supports it. So same processor, but extra crunch in the graphics. Yes, yeah. yeah. Second out of its box was the CompuLab Fit PC2. It claims to be the world's smallest, greenest computer, using under 9 watts of power. That's 90% less than most desktops. You see, when I walked in the room, I thought that was a wireless router. There's something quite cool about being able to toss your computer in the air. Finally, the Acer Aspire Revo. It's the cheapest of the three, runs Windows Vista, and has 2 gigabytes of RAM, double the memory of the other two. Aesthetically, this is the winner. Design sells to me that this is a modern, powerful, it's almost Apple-ish in its look. Mm. And it sort of feels like it should have some grunt behind it. For our first test, we wanted to see how they handled basic computing tasks that Martin's netbook had struggled with, starting with the e-box. What I'm going to do is I have downloaded my members graph. It's a nine megabyte file, and it takes a bit of processing crunch just to work it. So let's see if it can open it up. Oh, yes. Oh, Martin's graph. There Brilliant. you go. And Netbook couldn't have coped with this. I am very impressed. Martin then tried opening a large Word document at the same time. It seems to be fine. I'm scrolling up and down on that. Ooh. It's a bit slow, oh, isn't God. it? It's not. I think it's reaching the limits of what you can do. Next, we did the same test with the Fit PC. Ooh. Oh, yes. It feels a bit slower, doesn't it? Oh, well, there we go. It was slower with the graph and also struggled opening the second document. I have to say, if I were actually working right now, I'd be going... Yep. Come on! Finally, we tried the Revo. Oh, instant. Oh, I like that. Oh, yes. Oh, I like that. <laughs> it's very speedy. Absolutely excellent. I mean, uh, giving it the gold medal for this, no, mm. no problem. Good. Now, our second test for all three PCs is going to be a more ambitious multimedia multitasking test. We're going to see how long it takes to encode this video, which I shot in 1080p, right. into a format where you can play back on your mobile phone, whilst at the same time doing a tour in Google Earth and playing back a music track. And go, go, go! Martin's netbook wouldn't have coped with one of these programmes, never mind all three at once. But all our net tops handled everything without a problem, so it came down to how quickly they managed to encode the video. The Revo and Fit PC both took exactly 4 minutes 39 seconds, with the E-Box over 20% slower at 5.51. So, the Revo was still out in front as we came to our final test. All three claim to be able to play 1080p Ooh. HD video. HD. So, let's see how they get on, starting with the E-Box. Oh. <laughs> not the best. No, it should be better than that. The problem is, it's not a movie, it's a slideshow. It, it is. is. Could you, could you, could you. Next, the Fit PC. That's a good start. It's but not bad. It's moving, certainly. Well, it's in a different league to the last one, but it's mm. not perfect, isn't it? Because you get these sort of horizontal bars across I it. I mean, it's certainly watchable and you can see what's going on. The last one you would have stopped after 10 seconds. Mm. Mm. And finally, the Revo has undoubtedly been the best so far. Can it crack 1080p? Looks good. Mm. I've just realised what you're getting me to do. What's that? You're getting me to compare the meerkat. <laughs> I oh, can't believe he's I felt realized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Picture's great. Mm. I would be happy to watch that at home, and I don't think I would see any discernible difference from what I would expect to see if I were playing high definition through the television. So, after three exacting tests, did Martin feel the net tops were an improvement on his netbook? I would be happy if my netbook was as good as the worst of these, but the Revo handled everything I would need it to do 
perfectly reasonably, I would have no problem having that in my house, absolutely, and, and using it as a home office. Now for G ratings, and it's just two Gs for the E-Box. It was slowest at multitasking and really couldn't handle my 1080p movie. The Fit PC gets three Gs. It packed a lot of power for its size, but was the weakest at basic processing. And it's four Gs for the Revo. It triumphed in our tests, one Martin over, and it's the Gadget Show's favourite net top. If you want more information about net tops or to see some of John's other tests along with a whole load of reviews and best gadget buys, then check out our website at 5.tv slash gadget show. On it every single week of the year, you'll find a new episode of our online show, Gadget Show Web TV, where John reviews the newest tech, Dion brings you the latest gadget news, Otis does his own web exclusive investigations, and Jason tells you everything that's new in the world of gaming. Next up, it's time for the Wall of Fame. This is where all gadgets want to be, the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. Yeah, and we're about to add another icon to this roll call of tech-tasticness. This week, I'm deciding the outcome of a battle between two of the world's most iconic radio-controlled cars. It's Rough Rider versus Vanessa's Lunchbox. This is the awesome Rough Rider, the world's first truly off-road remote-controlled car. And when it was first released, it had boys, men, and rather butch ladies with facial hair, making noises like this. Oh, look at that thing go! <laughs> this pioneer of radio-controlled off-roading was designed by Dr. Taki of RC giants Tamiya after being inspired by watching Baja buddies racing around Californian deserts and deciding he'd like to make a mini version. First released in 1979, costing £115, the Rough Rider was an instant success. With its hard plastic body, fully independent suspension, huge semi-pneumatic rubber tyres and sealed-in electric components, the Rough Rider was the first RC car that could truly drive on any road surface. In its first few years of production, the Rough Rider sold hundreds of thousands of units. Tamiya promoted the Rough Rider by giving cars to leading Formula One drivers Alan Jones and James Hunt, who would play with them at Grand Prix weekends. The Rough Rider moved the whole game along in the world of RC cars, and it's amazing that 30 years after it was first released, you can still buy one of these iconic little cars. You can pick up a new Rough Rider for around 300 quid, but vintage models in good nick are extremely collectible and can fetch upwards of 1,500 pounds. No Wall of Fame on any show would be complete without a Rough Rider. It's pure gash perfection on wheels. Oh, bless him, and he's having such fun. But once again, Jace has got it all wrong because the remote control car that should be on the Wall of Fame is this, Vanessa's lunchbox. In the 80s, monster trucks weren't only big, they were big. Tamiya caught the mood of the moment and came up with Vanessa's lunchbox. Released in 1987, its Dodge minivan design was inspired by the real monster truck, Rolling Thunder. And with its powerful motor and high-performance suspension system, it was one scorching mama. I don't mind telling you that Vanessa's lunchbox had some whopping assets. Four 115mm tyres that could rip through the toppest of surfaces. A sealed gearbox that covered the diff gear from sand and dirt when off-roading. And a rear-mounted wheelie bar that was fantastic for stunts. Woohoo! Tamiya always used wacky names like Blackfoot and Midnight Pumpkin for their RC monster trucks. And they chose the name Vanessa as a pun on the word van. But when they made the first models, they included stickers which featured the telephone number of the sister of a Tamiya employee. She received literally thousands of phone calls from excited Tamiya fans wondering if she indeed was Vanessa. Dial my number, three digits, honey. And surprisingly, she changed her number quite quickly. Vanessa's lunchbox has proved to be one of the best-selling RC cars of all time, and it was so popular that it was relaunched in 2005. The design remains unchanged, and last year it was the biggest-selling RC from Tamiya. Come on, John, admit it. The vibrant Vanny is a sexy little minx that gets you hot under the collar. Surely she deserves a place in our glamorous wall of fame. 
hugely informative and absolutely fascinating. As ever, though, a couple of questions. Jason, the Rough Rider. I mean, I know it was pioneering, but it's not actually that distinctive, is it? I mean, it just looks like any radio-controlled off-road buggy-type car. No, not at all. I think it's really distinctive, and certainly it would have been in 1979. I mean, the thing is, this is an iconic design, OK? In fact, it's so distinctive, John, so iconic, that even now, if you were lucky enough to get your hands on the box from the original car, which featured hand-drawn artwork of the car, the box alone, John, not with the car in it, just the box would cost you upwards of about 250 quid online. Ooh. Yeah, that's if you can get one. That's, That's how iconic it is. Yep. Mm, mm. Now, Susie Vanessa's lunchbox. I love those old <laughs> American vans. I think they're fantastic. But the engineering's nothing like the quality on the Rough Rider. I mean, you can see bits of screws and all sorts. Of oh, things. surely this isn't a battle of engineering. I mean, look at this. It's just so cool. It was an unexpected hit in the 1980s. And if you want a car that wheeled, this was your baby. And a lot of people buy these, paint them black and red, you know, like the A-Team van. This is pure and adulterated fun, John. Ooh, fascinating, fascinating, and difficult to choose between these. I can see the appeal of the lunchbox, I can see the appeal of the Rough Rider, but uh, I have made my choice, and it is the Rough Rider. Yay! Because it was genuinely, and still is genuinely, revolutionary. It is a superb piece of engineering, and it's still very desirable today. And for all those reasons, it deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. Well said, John. There you go, Rough Rider, Wall of Fame, job done. Time for another short break now, but after that... Otis and I continue on our quest for flight as we try to build the ultimate man-powered flying machine. I'm flying, baby! Woo! And I get a little bit breathless as I choose our favourite sports watches with Olympic athlete Ewan Thomas. <laughs> flew 100 metres, which has never been achieved before. And if you do that, you win £30,000 for charity. Mm. Now, we'd already established Jason as our pilot. All that was left was to design and build a flying machine. At Gadget Birdman HQ, well, the University of Southampton, actually, our team of aerodynamics boffins, led by Kenji Takeda and Alex Forrester, were hard at work on our mission improbable, to build a craft capable of flying from Worthing Pier. Having seen many more complicated designs fail, we decided on a minimalist and lightweight glider design. It was simple, two very large wings, a tail fin, and some basic tail controls to enable me to maximise my chance of lift. Initial sketches had now become a virtual model, which meant we could start analysing just how it would perform in flight. The simulation here allows you to see how your aircraft performs under wind tunnel conditions. You can actually see how the air particles are moving around the wing. It's called computational fluid dynamics. As we'd hoped, the computational model suggested the air was moving more quickly over the wing to generate pressure and therefore lift underneath it. And it looks really cool. To test these simulated predictions, Alex and Kenji had put together a one-fifth scale model of our craft to analyse in a high-speed wind tunnel, complete with Mini-Me, which, rather worryingly, showed me tied tightly onto the craft with wire. I was hoping that wasn't part of the end design. Look at this thing, man! Look at it! So we fired up the wind and grabbed some string to visualise that crucial airflow. Our aerodynamic shape performed well, and that tail fin would be moved up and down using an elevator control to provide vital stability and maximise Jason's time in the air. In this tunnel, we're trying to simulate the, the craft very close to the ground, so what it will be like when you're skimming along in the ocean waves. Which is the advantage we have over um, the hang gliders, because they're, they're dangling pendulum-like. They yeah. hit the water, whereas we can use the ground effect, can't we? Wing in ground effect refers to the phenomenon which takes place when a winged object, be it a pelican or a plane, flies very close to the ground. In normal flight, there are usually spiralling vortices of air at the wingtips which cause drag. But if the ground interferes with these, there'll be a sudden reduction in drag and an increase in lift, an occurrence that designers of ground effect planes have tried to harness. Assuming Jason could pull out of the initial dive from the pier, our design meant we could benefit from this too. And our results from the wind tunnel looked impressive, but to the trained eye, they were telling a slightly worrying story. For the speeds that we think you'll get to, uh, we're not actually producing enough lift. If you're not producing enough lift, that would mean Jason goes straight into the drink, right? 
at, a, at an angle. At an angle, OK. So how can we adjust well, that? Um, what we would propose is to basically build a bigger wing. Uh, the rule constraints mean that we can't have a longer wing, so essentially we're just going to make it wider here. It's going to look huge and it's going to be scary. And I'm going to have seen people dressed as chickens go... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But we've confidence you'll get it right first time. Thanks, Alex. With all the testing and modelling done, it was time to start building the flying machine. To give ourselves the best chance of winning the Birdman competition and breaking the hallowed 100 metre flight distance, we decided we wanted to have two jumps, which meant we needed to build two craft. And we wanted to keep them as lightweight as possible, using foam ribs attached to strong but light carbon tubes, which we hoped would bend enough to aid our flight without actually snapping. All covered with a thin polyester film, which had to be carefully ironed into place to ensure our aerodynamic shape was as smooth as it could be. That's all right, isn't it? That's that is good. more than all right, man. Don't worry, we'll get the kinks out. The main thing is that, ah, leading edge? Yeah, let's Leading edge, baby. Give it a bit of the old double sweep. Yeah, that's a nice action. Thanks, man. It's enormous. We keep thinking it looks stupid with the, the size of the wings, but we've done the calculations, and if we made it look reasonable, we're sure we'd crash. Uh, yeah. You'd crash. Yeah. We've made it look ridiculous, but the calculations show you might not crash. But I love it. I love you for that. I was acutely aware that when it came to launching this thing off the pier, there'd be no room for error. But that's where our secret weapon came in. Kenji had modified the university's flight simulator to help me train for my heroic leap, even replicating the tail fin control with a joystick. We've not got a model of our actual aircraft, but we've got hang gliders, so yeah. something quite similar. We're going to release you and you're going to plummet to the ground, uh, picking up airspeed, and then you're going to have to yank back on the stick and then you'll start climbing out and go into a shallow, shallow glide. Got it. So I'll give you a countdown of three, two, one. OK. And then you'll be jumping off the pier, OK? Got you it. Ready? Three, two, one, go. And as I took to the air, I could almost hear the crowd. Oh, oh, too much. Oh, and the splash oh, as I crashed straight into the sea. So that's us finished at Worthing, that's it. <laughs> Job done. My first go may not have been great, but after a few attempts, man and machine were beginning to work in perfect harmony. Perfect. Looks like a record. Looks like you did it. All I needed to do was to replicate that controlled action while executing a terrifying leap off a pier in front of thousands of people. Easy. Yeah, keep pulled back. Yeah, OK, <sighs> climb a little bit, climb a little bit. Yeah! And with the event day looming, it was time to practice on the real thing. Well, a half-sized skeleton, at least. When I do that, I want it to pitch me nose down. When I do this, I want it to pitch me nose up, yeah? That's right. <laughs> And so, just down the road from where the revolutionary Spitfire made its maiden flight, I prepared for my first Birdman takeoff. Well, sort of. Two, one. Pull back. Yeah, I feel good. Feet up. Is that good? Feet are in good position. Oh, looks good. Woohoo! I'm flying, baby! Woohoo! So, did we build a flying machine? capable of soaring off Worthing Pier. Well, to give you an idea of the plan, here's a scale replica of the actual machine. OK, that's me in model form. Uh, this represents us up on the pier. Off I go, off the pier. This is the idea, OK? I'm supposed to descend towards the sea, head first. Go for it, Otis. Once Jason and Kraft reach a certain speed, they should experience lift. Yeah, that's the, the general idea. At this point, of course, the pilot in me has to kick in, and I've got to go manual. There's an elevator on my right hand, which I then, I'm supposed to throw forward, I think, and then it goes forward like this, and I'm into this sort of up and down motion, oh. trying to get it to flatten out and use the ground effect just above the ocean, which is our killer app. That's what's, that was what was going to enable us to actually get to that 100 metres. So you've got a sort of roller coaster effect going on with that. So is that actually what happened then? Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Susie. <laughs> After this very short break, come back and see whether the Gadget Show's quest for flight was successful. It was for me to man up, slip on my lucky trunks, <laughs> grab a few pieces of wood and jump off a very tall pier. A beautiful summer's day at Worthing for the International Birdman Challenge. The 10-metre platform beckoned. It was a time for heroes. A time for stout hearts. But not a great time for TV presenters who are scared of heights. No! 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 
you cast all your fears and yeah. your worries yeah. on me. Can I do that? Yeah, I'll do what I will with them, and then you'll you'll have nothing to worry about. That's cool. So okay? they, yeah, the, I mean, the main fear I have as I as I go off is death. Fear of death. You, you see, you're not making me feel that good. We were to have two attempts, which meant two identical craft, and both currently lay in pieces on the pier. But as we, together with Kenji, Alex and our build team, put our first craft together, our confidence grew. With that massive 30-foot flexible wingspan and brand new winglets to smooth out that messy air at the wing tips, it was looking every inch the sleek flying machine we'd hoped for. This thing is huge. It's got winner written all over it. <laughs> the bird's going to put on that plane. That's really good luck. Nice one. <laughs> As the first lunatics started throwing themselves off the platform, I was getting in some vital launch practice. I'd had to get the angle just right to generate enough airspeed off the platform, which would unfortunately mean diving head first towards the sea. That's forward. Back down, back. Back and forward to back. <laughs> Oh, 100 meters. That was a full flight, baby. There were two serious classes in the competition, the hang gliders and the Leonardo class for innovative, self-built craft. Both had already launched once the day before. In the hang glider class, Steve Elkins had flown an incredible 99.86 meters, falling agonizingly short of the 100 meter jackpot. But our rivals in the Leonardo class had gone pretty much straight into the drink in a variety of painful ways. That's gonna win the man. Even three-time winner Bill Brooks and his pedal-powered machine failed to get big air, meaning the current Leonardo distance to beat was just over 15 metres. So, kitted up and preparing for launch now, I was beginning to feel the tension. We're getting close, we're getting close. I can feel, I can feel the moment approaching. I just don't want to let these boys down. This is a precision instrument and I don't want to be the one to mess it up. Then we had our call. Gadget One was up next. That is, if I didn't break it before we started. Oh! No, that's, that's, that's OK. That's OK, we can fix that. After some light repairs, we were ready for launch. This was it. All the design work, all the testing, all the training, down to a few seconds and the finest details. I know, mate. Yeah, I know, mate. Tundra, I know, mate. I can tell you how, how... Right. It's all right. Hey. scared of Phil, man. One more time. I don't want to mess how it up. How are we doing this? There was no backing out now. But unfortunately, the all-important wind had dropped and shifted direction. This was going to be tough. Let's do it! Let's do it! Go! Come on, Jason. Come on, Jason. Come on. What a shame! Oh, man! Well, I hadn't died, and we'd made it out to 24.7 metres. But we were frustrated. I'd pulled the elevator at the right time. Those wings had bent to give us stability and lift. We just needed some more wind. A few knots of airspeed, and that was a 50, 60 metre As, soon, as yeah. soon as you took off, Jason, the windsock just dropped. I could feel the wings sucking me up into yeah. the air. I could feel it happening. I just needed another metre to finish my little glide slope. Yeah. As we hastily assembled our second craft, to make matters worse, Bill Brooks ditched his pedals and bettered our mark, reaching 28.88 metres. We had to improve. In these conditions, 100 metres may have been looking unlikely, but we just needed five metres more to win our class. This was our last chance for glory, and I was determined to make it count. School of Engineering this is it, man. Sciences of University. Got one more chance to get this right. I'm going to go further back. If the wind is pants, it's all down to the physics and my kahunas. Come on! Come on! Take it! Come on! Come on! Come on! We'd done it! 30.07 metres, the furthest Leonardo class flight of the weekend. Just as we'd planned, as I'd launched from the platform, I pulled the elevator. And though it may have been brief, I was definitely flying. 
for 4.44 seconds, in fact, until the wingtip caught a wave and wiped me out. It flies, man! It flies! That is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most exciting thing I've ever done in my entire life. Maybe the birth of my children, but that definitely is just up there. Oh, oh, oh. That was fantastic. Look at this, look at this. Jason Bradbury for the longest flight in the Leonardo da Vinci class. Oh, that's that's nice. Awesome. Well done. Oh, you did so well. We, we all did. I mean, I think, don't you think, Susie, we had an incredible team. Yeah, and, fantastic. You know, especially the University of Southampton guys, those guys are incredible. This stuff essentially was theory, yeah? We may have used wind, wind tunnels in computer modelling, but it was theory until I went over that pier. Yeah, well done for actually jumping off, by the Thank way. Thank you. But, but what was incredible was watching in the wings work where the weather came Yeah, the dihedral. Yeah. It's just as they said it would. Well done to you. Well done to the team. Great, great event. That's all we've got time for on this week's show. We'll see you very soon. See you next time. See you. See you, Birdman. <laughs> hey. I love the sound of that.